Hello, my name is Ramon. I go by Malão in the YouTube and in Twitch. I play RPGs since Diablo 1, I played Diablo 2, and I fell in love with Hardcore Diablo 2, and then I played Diablo 3. I played Power of Exile since 2017. I played all the expansions of Diablo 3. I have played Diablo 4 now, Diablo 4 Bad. And I killed most bosses of Power of Exile, didn't kill all of them. I take into consideration defenses since I play Hardcore. I will make a guide here that is going to be my first very didactic video. It's going to help everybody. Like, it, it doesn't matter if you're a newcomer for Power of Exile, if you're completely green in Power of Exile, or green completing ARPGs, I'm going to try to help you all. Or if you're kind of experienced and you want to just test something different, or if you clicked here just for criticizing myself, my speech, my build, everybody's welcome. <laughs> I'm good. Could you want to make me get offended? I made this build here and it really pleases me. The way that this build goes, it's really comfortable. I don't play metal builds in general. I play play metal builds they please me. But normally the metal builds don't please me that much. I like fireball, I like flame blast, I like some slams, I like some I don't know, some cyclone builds. I like my builds. But I I really like to have comfort. Yakking yeah, things is good and all, but I prefer to have comfort too enjoy what I'm doing while I'm playing, you know? This build here is very comfortable. I will say that this build is not very fast. You can see this is a tier 16 map. It's very in game. The map is kind of juiced. I was like recording standard to make this video for this video specifically. It is very tanky. That's the most important part of the video. But as you can see the setup really clears everything. Like everything dies for the, the, the sheer damage of the fireball and the way that it spreads, and everything dies around it. And my single target damage is in the Flame Blast. It's pretty decent. I really like to play this build and I hope that you like to. So let's go for the guy. So if you know what you're doing, just keep hearing the chapters for the build part. I'm going to organize and you just go there. If you don't stay here, I'm going to explain everything that I can to make you less green or less zeroed in ARPGs in or in Pebble Exile. So the first thing that I need is I need you to go and download Path of Building Community 4. Path of Building Community 4. You click on it and then you download this app, this program here. This program will help you a lot. If you navigate through the YouTubers, the people that post guys like myself, you're going to find this POB, POB, POB everywhere. It's this app here, okay? Download it, install it. And then you click on the description of the video that I left the POB there and you come here in import export and then you click right here and you paste the the link of the build and you're going to have the build right at you. Right. This app is a little scary because it's too complex, there's a lot of mathematics involved in Parallel Exile, but you don't need to know everything. What you need to know to understand this guide here is these little buttons here, okay, this goes for the tree, that's the passive tree of Power Exile and all the ascendances and all. And you click here in skills, I'm going to have organized the skills here for you. Those are the items that are organized for you to see, and you don't need to know the, the other buttons. You come in tree, and the first part of the build uh, needs you to click here. You come down here and you select 34, that's the first part of the build because this teaches you how to level up, how you are going to organize your tree as you go forward in levels, okay? And the other part of the guide needs you to click here. I have three item sets here. The first one that you're going to put together with this tree, 34 here, is this 34 items. These, are, these items are very basic, very bad, but that's, that, these are generals for what you're going to find in day one in any league. Because in day one, everybody's so self-found. Nobody has anything. There's not even trade because people don't have anything. It's a new league. So these items are like, I don't know, medium, what you're going to have by level 34. And then when you advance, you click on the feasible high mapping. These are actually my items of on when I died, level 95 in Crucible League. Which was the last league of Pair of Exile. So these items here are all real. They dropped or were crafted or were traded 
in Crucible League. And these items here, the end game, is what you aim for. These are very impossible items to find, and these are the mods that are, you're going to be looking for. And then if you know more, you can go for some variations, but you have the three possible items here. So the first concepts that you are going to encounter in Power Exile, your skills. In the beginning of the game, you find gems. These gems are powers, or supports of powers. There are two types of gems in the game. They are active or support. For example, if I hover my mouse here, you can see that this icon here is different from this icon, which means that this is an active gem and this is a support gem. These icons, the different icons, only appear when you suck at them. But that's not important. This is a spell. This is a spell called Flame Blast. You channel and an explosion builds up and explodes. Now, these five gems here, they support Flame Blast. That's what this is. So this here is called a six link. This here is called a four link. This here is Fireball. You cast a Fireball. And for the example of Fireball, this support gem, greater multiple projectile support, makes uh, only support projectile skills, as you can read there. And the skills inflict less damage, but they fire four additional projectiles. So you have these things, these kinds of things, damage, duration, projectiles, every type of interaction that you gave us until today. So these are links. This is how the game works. And do you see these little connections here? They make it possible for you to support an active gem with that support. Look at my gloves. My gloves have malevolence here, that is one aura. Doesn't need supports in my build. But here I have two actives. I have Summon Stone Golem and I have Shield Charge. Both of those active gems are two separate skills. And one skill called Faster Attacks makes them attack faster. So this support gem is supporting both of those active skills because they are linked by this link here. But neither of those are connected to Malevolence. So, because no link reaches Malevolence, the faster attacks doesn't support Malevolence. It only supports Shield Charge and Summon Stone Golem. Okay? It doesn't matter where it is. For example, here you can see that Deadly Ailments is far. One, two, three far from Flame Blast. But it doesn't matter because it supports it the same way. Right? Those are the links. So, auras or permanent effects that you use, they reserve your mana. For example, here you can see my Malevolence reserves 50% mana. So, 50% of all my mana is reserved. I cannot use it. It shows with this gray metallic hue here. It means that I cannot, I don't have access to that mana. I have a smaller pool. So I have to invest in mana regen and other things, right? But it's very important to reserve your mana. In Path of Exile 1, it's very important to reserve your mana. You get defenses, you get offense from auras that have the gem tag aura, or other buffs. For example, we have here Tempest Shield, that is a spell lightning and chaining. So it has no tag of aura, but it's kind of an aura because it gives you a buff and effect and reserves your mana. So, mana reservation is really important. One thing that is important is also nodes that give you mana reservation. In this case, we have these nodes here, reservation, in the left of your passive tree, right? In the very left of your passive tree, you have here reservation efficiency and you have here sovereignty. Very easy to get as Templar or Witch just travel here very fast. There are other ways in other parts of the tree, but those are the ones that I get because they are very accessible here and they, they help you a lot. There are gems that gives you these two as you link them, support gems, but they are very rare and tend to be very expensive because of their rarity. So right in the beginning of the game, around level 10 in the first act, playing Witch, 
you are going to have access to Steel Skin. It's this gem here. Steel Skin is one of the Guardian skills. Guardian skills, they share a cooldown with themselves, so you can only use one at once. And what they have a specialty is that they are instant. And the instant skills don't have an animation to cast. So the first tip if you're a newcomer to this game is to socket in a red, this in the case of steel skin a red socket, and you get your button to move instead of click on move only here at the left click of the mouse, you click on the steel skin. A lot of people that come from Diablo have the left click being the attack button. This is bad. Because sometimes you don't want to attack, you don't want to do anything. Sometimes you want to avoid a slam from a boss or something. So what you need is just to move. For example, here in the hideout, I'm going to walk and it's going to cast it. Look at the symbol here. Okay, it lasts for a little bit of time. Cool down. Two, one, zero. So that's, that's a great tip. There are other ways to use the guard skills. That's one of the most efficient ways, because this way it's up every time that you have it on cooldown. The game is defined by tags. Tags are very important to understand what they are. So, for example, if you hover over flame blast here or fireball, you can see in the tooltip that appears, the second line, the first line is the name of the gem, fireball. The second line you have projectile, spell, AOE, and fire. You have four tags. So anything that affects projectiles is going to affect fireball. Anything that affects spells will affect fireball. So on and so forth. Sometimes one thing doesn't affect the other. Fireball here ignites the target, has chance to ignite the target. So the fireball hits the target, there is one instance of damage, and if it ignites the target, the damage over time the enemy suffers is another instance of damage. From the gem tag spell, anything that is spell damage in the game will increase the damage of the spell, which normally includes the hit. So the hit of the fireball will be scaled up as much as you invest in spell. But the ignite damage, the damage over time from igniting the enemy, is not scaled by spell, by increasing spell. The ignite damage is increased by fire damage over time, fire damage, damage over time, burning damage, damage. Okay, so these things, they, they increase, they ignite damage. So these are a little tricky. Another trick to see if one thing works with another is, in the case here, Ignite Proliferation is a support gem. You hover over and that table appears. You can see that there is a, a cross where the skill doesn't work with this support. In PoE 2, they are making so that we cannot even socket to a skill that is wrong. But in PoE 1, not really. You can socket one support skill that doesn't work with your active skill. But hovering the mouse on the support gem will tell you, will help you. And so, this is one of the things. The other thing is paying attention at what gem tag is going to do what. You have several of these and the game is full of tags. So pay attention in your tags. So some skills are called Veil skills. You can see, for example, here, I have Arctic Armor that is also a Veil Arctic Armor. It shows here in the bottom. The Arctic Armor is one skill that is a buff and it works separately from the Veil Arctic Armor. The Veil Arctic Armor can only be activated when I have souls. What is this? As I kill monsters, I gain souls. When I gain a threshold of souls, I gain one charge of Veil Arctic Armor. And then when I have one charge of it, Archie Armor, I have this effect here. That I freeze myself for 5 seconds, and during these 5 seconds, I can take up to 3 instances of damage. And the, I take 90% less damage from this 
the veil object armor finishes when either the five seconds pass or I take three hits, three damaging hits. This is a defensive buff, and is the example that I'm going to show you. I'm going to kill some monsters and get a charge. I don't use the hotkey here. I don't use this hotkey because this is my mouse, middle mouse button. I have a two dollar mouse, so don't <laughs> count on it. But I put it here. So since it's the same one, I will use pressing this button from this hotkey here, but I leave it out here too because I want to see if the charge is set. So you can see that it's already a quarter and as I kill monsters it will grow more. So I have a charge and Arctic Armor you can only have one charge as you can see. So when I use Arctic Armor I freeze. I cannot move. I'm clicking to move. I cannot move for five seconds. Look. One, zero. That's it, like I described it. You have many interactions, many types of veil skills. Some leagues they add more veil skills and they all work in these mechanics of souls. So there's something called the Lord's Labyrinth that you gain access when you do some Trials of Ascendancy that will appear throughout the game. So as you do the Trials of Ascendancy, you gain access to the lab. Okay, this is the lab. You have some options, the lab 33, 55, 68, and 75. You have to do six trials of ascendancy, and you can see that in my standard league here, I have all completed, and you have the locations here, for example, the lower prison, act one, completed. The crypt level one, act two. The chamber of sins level two, act two. The crematorium, act three. The catacombs, act three. The imperial gardens, act three. When you complete these six, you forever gain access to the level 33 labyrinth. You come here, you do it, you finish it, you choose your ascendancy. In my case here is elementalist. But if you are a witch, you can go for elementalist, occultist, or necromancer, right? So after that, you go for the act 6 lower prison, act 7 the crypt, Act 7, the Chamber of Sins level 2. And by level 55, you will gain access to the Cruel Labyrinth. Two more points. Again, no, four points. Merciless Labyrinth, after you complete the Bath House, Act 8. The Tunnel, Act 9. And the Ossuary, Act 10. And for you to gain the 7th and 8th points on the Ascendancy Passive Tree, you just have to have one offering to the goddess. There was a different method before, but it doesn't matter. They changed it. All you need to do is do maps or link content. One time, one of those will drop and you're going to find it. One of the most common ways that everybody gets in the beginning of leagues is that you find a trial of ascendancy of six that use it to be obligatory. Now you just find one of these six, do it all until the end, the end will have a mirror, click on the mirror, a portal appears so that you come back to the map and one offering to the goddess drops. You come directly here and you do your last lap. That's the lap for you. So the Blight League is the tower defense league that drops oils for you. And these oils are very important for you to anoint items. So after you encounter Cassia in the maps, and you complete her quest, that is just complete one of the tower defenses, you're going to be able to anoint items in your hideout. So what happens is that you come here and you're going to favorite this in your navigator, okay? This link here, it's in the description, list of ring anointments. You have the full list of the ring anointments right here. And you also have the anointments when you press ALT on top of notables. For example, Purity of Flesh here, you press ALT, it shows you, you need clear, black and silver oil. You can see the tooltip right there. You can see the, the image of the oils and you can see the name of the oils. Whatever skill you want, you press ALT and you're going to have Azure, Violent, Opalescent. For example, we are going to anoint Ballistics. 
in one amulet here, a random amulet that I got here. Okay? The amulet cannot be corrupted for you to unlight it. So ballistics, as we can see here, is azure, violet, and opalescent. We come here and steal. I put azure, violet, and opalescent. So you're going to see the appears ballistics here. And it's, it's showing you here 20% increased production speed, production damage, and dexterity, as you can see here, right? And then you click on anoint, and you're going to anoint it. Oof. Now when you hover your mouse over it, it allocates ballistic, and it shows ballistics there. So that's it, that's the bright lead, very important. You can light rings as well, and you come from this list here, you look at what it does, but the ring anointments, they are mostly for use in the, the Blight League. So the Blight League is going to be influenced with towers by your ring anointments. So let's get here, for example, clear oil and clear oil. Your chilling towers do 25% increase in damage. So you come here with your ring, clear oil and clear oil. Chilling tower damage. Chilling towers do 25% increase in damage. Oof. Anointed, anointed, you can see here. Right? Right link, always important. So flasks are very important in your life. If you are a life-based build, you need a divine light flask. Normally I put the, the uh, seating base on mine because it's 66% reduced amount recovered, but it's instant recovery. So it, you normally don't die like a five second death. Normally when you die, it's like less than a second. So you have a reaction time to react to that and evade death by pressing a flask of those, I, I would use a flask of those. And also you have quartz flask that gives you spell suppress and phasing, pretty powerful. You have quicksilver that gives you movement speed. You have jade flask that gives you evasion rating. Apart from those you have other types of flasks. Granite flasks that gives you armor. Diamond flask that gives you global critical strike chance. You have amethyst flask that gives you chaos resistance. And you have other types of elemental flasks that gives you elemental resistances as well. For example, the sapphire flask is the cold version one. You have cold resistance and you take less cold damage. You have one version of those for each of the elements. You also have the prismatic flask that gives you plus two all elemental resistances. They're all very situational. But you should always have them used when shard which is full or some other enchantments that you can find in your hideout. So for example, you tend to unlock enchantments when you have the, the sufficient orbs, you can go and enchant and they are very powerful and very useful. They give you a lot of quality of life. There was a polemic recently about flask piano because people were like destroying their fingers, the, I don't know, the articulation by having to press too much the flask buttons. And now they made a lot of automation for the flask. So it's very useful for you to enchant the flask. You have various logical conditions here for the flask to be used. So it's very important. You can see my other builds. All of my flasks, they have the little tube coming out of it, which means they have the enchantment. In my case, normally they are automatized. Very important. So let's go over some league content here. One of the my favorite league contents is cards. The cards drop in the game depending on the map that you are and the zone of leveling that you are. And they have these sets. For example, you can see here is 1 slash 5, which means that you need 5 of Emperor's Luck. So you come to your hideout or there you can stay here. You come to Lily Roth and you click here. Trade divination cards. In my case here, my only full set others. Yeah. This is. Hail God Slayer. Click here, trade, gets the result of it. So, very cool. I love cards. Who doesn't like cards? Maps. When you finish the campaign, you're going to, to run Act 8, 4th, you start to drop maps, you're going to be all Tier 1 during your campaign, and then when you get to the maps, you get a little bit of a quest with um, Kirik, and after that you're going to gain a map device to put in your hideouts, and you'll be able to put maps 
there. Maps basically are some of the maps that you face during the campaign, right? Some zones are going to be maps and they are specific areas with specific bosses and you have to learn them. That's the art way, you have to learn them. You have to learn which boss is what, which boss does what, and it's, it's cool. It's a really cool part of the end game of Power Exile. Unique items, they give you different things. Now, this would be a long explanation. It's better for you to just follow your guide and look for the unique items that you prefer. If you want to create your own guide, or just look for the guides that you're following and, and look for those uniques. But they, they are many unique items and every league they, they, they create more. So, it's vast. Essences, it's been a long time, I'm pouring essences here, but the different essences, they, they drop from monsters that are imprisoned in a temporal stasis or something, and the different essences, they are made to craft different types of items. What they do is that they work like chaos orbs or alchemy orbs, and they force one stat. For example, here, you can read in one-handed weapons. Adds 26 to 35, 51 to 60 cold damage to spells. I have three here. So I can click once in an item, and this item is going to have this stat and some more. And you can spend this until you get a decent, I don't know, base for you to continue crafting. If, it, like, very rarely you get a full item with one, one essence being used. The fossils gave us something called fossil crafting. You have different fossils that give you different things and you get these fossils and you socket them in these resonators and after you socket them you create a currency specific of the combination of fossils that you socketed in this little thing and this currency applied on an item is going to apply is going to transform this item accordingly now you have metamorph i hate this league super rippy super deadly i like to play hardcore very much i basically don't touch this but it's a lot of people do and they the the metamorphs they drop catalysts the catalysts basically are quality for belts rings and amulets of different things here for example we have one with attack modifiers and one with elemental damage modifiers. They also drop organs, make organ combinations to create monsters that you can kill in a controlled way in the Thames laboratory and you get drops from the weapon. They're like, this was like the boss thing. You create your own boss. Deliriums from the Delirium League is like a fog that appears and drops Delirium Worms. You get 300, you get to enter a similar cool, very hard encounter, one of the hardest encounters in the game. You need a very specific build, and you can get destroyed depending on the random mobs that appears in the similar cool. And these currencies here are all to make your map have delirium forcing in them. And these spaces here are for maps that have delirium natural. You have the fragment tab, and it's very cool because you have different leagues giving you different types of fragments. Here have at Ziri in the Veil uh, expansion. This is all for Legion. You have here the Shaper. You have the Elder here. And then you, you have different types of fragments for different types of labs. And you have many, many different types. These are the, the Conquerors. This is the Uber, uh, Uber at Ziri. You have Breach fragments. You have Scarabs that they are going to force things to appear in your maps. And you have the Eldritch and Maven uh, fragments that they are going to be boss encounters that you put on that device. Ye this, these things you learn little by little. I don't want to make a video long explaining each one of them. These are very advanced, you learn them little by little. So this is the currency tab. This is a mirror of Calandra. Don't, don't care about it. You're not going to find one or you're not going to use one. So <laughs> you, you may find one, I'm just joking. I play for Exile for six years now. Uh, it's almost getting to seven years, and I found one in my whole career of exile. So, most likely you're not going to find it. Be very realistic here. Unless you have thousands and thousands of hours like we have. <laughs> and even if you find it, it's something so rare that you want you to stay with yours. So don't, don't think about it. <laughs> so, 
This is the exalted orb. It augments a rare item with a new random modifier. This is the regal orb. Upgrades a magic items to rare. Alchemy orb. Upgrades normal item to rare. The kills orb. Changes one rare to another type of rare. Divine orb. Randomizes the numerical values on the random modifiers of an item. And the orb of an element removes a random modifier from an item. Alteration orb. Remove, reforge the magic item with new random modifiers. Transmutation orb upgrades a normal item to a magic item. Ancient orb reforges a unique equipment as another of the same item class. Orb of binding upgrades a normal item to a rare item with up to four linked sockets. Improves the quality of a strong box, the engineers. Orb, you, you use this in the maps, in the campaign. Orb of Regret brings a passive skill with fun points, you just click it and get a passive point. Orb of Scouring removes all modifiers from an item. Blessed Orb randomizes the numeric values of the implicit modifiers of an item. Veil Orb corrupts an item, modifying it unpredictably. Very good for many situations. This doesn't exist anymore, this is a rogue. <laughs> for the, the base here league, very polemic. This don't exist anymore, all of these girls coins for all times. And the sex, sextants, <laughs> so times. The sextants, the awakened sextant, sextants, you add the reroll modifier in a void stone. Harbor your orb, reforge the map items of another of a higher tier. Orb of Horizon, reforge the map items of another of the same tier. If the cartographic chisel improves the quality of a map, improves the quality of a gem, the gem cutters. Glass blower, improves the quality of a flask, improves the quality of an armor. Use the quality of a weapon. Crazy portal to town. Ident identifies an item. This is the currency tab for you. And I don't have one of the new ones. I I, I should have by sold one the last league. And that's it. You have to, to get like different videos and guides to learn to use them. It's very complicated to make one huge guide learning every single one and every single use of every single one. So this, this is hard. What you have to do is try little by little, watch one guide here, one guide there. The problem is I'm going to be posting many guides, you're going to learn everything from my channel. But for this learn, I was just presenting the currency tab here for you guys to learn and understand what they do. And of course you have the tool tip you can read by yourself, but here I just read it all at once so that you are presented for this. <laughs> so going now for the initial part of the build in which you are going to level from 1 to 34. You check how is your progress, how you're going, well, comparing the items that you have here by clicking here in 34, in this section, and in the tree, you click on 34 too. You should roughly be able to get these, these passives here. I have a little bit of mana here, some life. You can remember to click on the life mastery here, okay? Remember to click on this and on this life mastery too. So, Talking about this life mastery here, that is skills cost life instead of 30% of mana cost. One of the skills that you are going to be using in the beginning of the game, in the 34, these are the initial skills that you should have at level 34. One of them gets around level 10, it's called Clarity. It's a mana regen aura. It gives you mana regen. Because in the game, if you are a mage, it, and you don't invest in mana or in mana auras, it's you're going to struggle with mana unless you use a mana flask but that's not ideal to use all the time sometimes you're in a boss fight and you need to have the mana and you don't have a tp to get out so it's nice to have the mana sustained there so not only you have clarity but starting to invest in mana early on might solve your problem or using skills cost life instead of 30 percent of mana cost which helps you can use the three of them the skill, the, the, the mastery of the skill life costs mana here, this, and clarity, or none of them, or any variation of them, you measure, you do your thing. But normally with this build, at this point I like to have my mana sustain like this, and I, I just, I sometimes I use mana flasks, especially like channel, channeling flame blast, it gets hard, the mana really drains very fast. So apart from the mana, I just invest in life until level 34. I invest in this one here because it gives you a little bit of resistance as well as some Caspian fire skills which you're going to be using fire damage. So 
it's very well rounded, this notable here. This here for the elemental resistances too. And this build I invest in golems. Because the golems are your buffs and your decoy totems. What are decoy totems? To decoy totems are totems that you put on the ground so that they are going to taunt enemies. And the enemies are going to attack the decoy totem. The decoy totem has some life. And until it gets destroyed, it is going to be taunting enemies. Your golems not necessarily taunt the enemies, but they block attacks. Especially missile attacks, projectile attacks. They can block them. They can help you because they distract the boss. Sometimes they taunt, sometimes they don't. So they help a lot. Not only they are buffs, but they are kind of free. Decoy totems for you. You just have to be aware because by the maps, by the end game, you're going to have four golems and you shouldn't go under maps that have chain because you can be blasted by chain. You should be mean to chain, by the way. So until level 34, you get these this points and then when you get the lab, you get the first one so that you don't need to be resummoning these golems. And the first uh, uh, buff to the buff of the golems. 100% increase the effect of buffs granted by your golems, you can see here. And the golems are resummoned 4 seconds after being killed. This quality of life, and since I'm investing in golems anyway, I just go for it. So, I also start with, as you can see here, Chaos Golem and Stone Golem. Those are the two defensive golems. I play very defensively, I don't like to die in hardcore, I hate to die in, in all leveling, especially my first character, and I'm definitely not a racer, so I take my time, especially now that I stream, I talk to the chat, so yeah, no, I like to have life regen, and I like to, to, to have my physical damage reduction from the goals. So up to level 34, it's the time that you are going to be able to do the lab, that's the tree, you follow it, you try to get, you try to mirror your items to something close to this and she's basically life and resistances and you're going to be good so as you go through the acts you're going to go after level 34 obviously so you come here in this part of the tree and you click on 55 you're going to have some modification here a little more life here right mage bane is useful because transforms provides no inherent bonus to evasion rating and then plus one chance to suppress spell damage per 15 dexterity so in the case of my character here in Standard League, I gain 10% chance to suppress spell damage. So this is pretty good. It's not bad. Not at all. This is one layer of defense that is uh, of the many layers that I have. One that is really important. Right now I have 50% from other sources as well. So the 10% that I get here is, is pretty good. So I take this from the beginning of the game, like I said. I like to play hardcore and I like to level up in peace, I don't like to die. So I get all my defensive skills and keystones and passives and gems from the get-go. So here is more life, here is a little bit of evasion rating, why not, we are so close here. And these nodes give you spell suppress. So you have spell suppress here, and a spell suppress here, spell suppress here. And a little bit of evasion as well. And more life. Here you have holy dominion. That gives you not only elemental damage, which is good for you, right? And plus 12% to all elemental resistances. So those are the modifications of the tree until you get to level 55 that you can see here in the path of beauty. And by the time that you get here, you should get your items and instead of 34, you click in feasible high mapping. These items that are here, they are exactly my items in Crucible League, the way they were when I died level 95 in Crucible League, lastly, so these items are all feasible, they, are, they either dropped it like this, or I crafted them like this, or I bought them like this, so they are very realistic, because they are real, and they are very feasible to obtain, right, until the maps, and this is your goal, you should have them, and I'm going to explain them one by one later on the video, so here's the same thing as before, as you progress, you don't change here anymore, you just maintain this list of items here, but then you go to the tree and you put here 68. Oh, keep in mind that 55, you have two more passive points here in the ascendancy tree. You go for the rest of the elementers, so to, you can have the third 
golem and the fourth is going to come here this one so you're already going to have four golems by the time that you're 55 and then by the time that you get to 68 you are going to have a little more passives so i invest a little more here these are defensive nodes again curse reduction chaos resistance and immunity to corrupted blood corrupted blood some enemies have this some enemies eat you and they inflict corrupted blood it's a physical damage over time debuff that you can get up to 20 and it really hurts leveling and in high maps when you are in early maps these don't hurt very much unless you get like 20 stacks which is the maximum but normally you get some stacks and your reflex is enough for you to hit your life flask button and you're safe but when you're leveling they they tend to appear i don't know in act seven or six which you're you're struggling with gear especially in the league start you barely have life or resistances or either this is going to hurt and in high maps this is going to hurt and in or insta kill you so i like to be immune by the passive tree especially in the league start because the other ways of being immune to this are much harder to obtain but here you just click a button that's a mastery you have to have the notable allocated here in order to be able to pay the mastery so you pay the mastery and you're good corrupted blood immune apart from this i travel here to the nodes of reservation and a little more life so as you progress through maps and you get all the passive points from the ascendancies and all the passive points from the tree and decent gear you get to be tanky okay you get a lot of life you get the resistances and maximum resistances plus over 75 you get spell bulk you get spell suppression and you have some bulk chance for attacks and your physical damage reduction is not this much here it's much more okay because of the damage conversion from physical to elements so you're pretty decently tanky and you can you it's not like you're going to be tanking slams that's not the point you never it doesn't matter which build you you never tank slams ever nope you dodge slam you invade slams but you can you can do a tier 16 map with ease without I don't know, big jump scares. It's fine. It's pretty doable. And the damage is also decent. Remember that 1 million DPS for damage over time is more or less 2 million DPS for hit builds. So, with this damage, you can actually do all the content in the game. Maybe struggle with the over pinnacle. Maybe no. You will be struggling with over pinnacle bosses. But apart from that, you can actually do the, the, the whole content of the game. Pretty, pretty fine. So, I advise you. Yep. A nice build i really like it so the way the build works is that you shield charge and flame dash your way through the maps you keep clearing casting fireball so the whites and blues are going to be dead in no time and some rares too and then when you see rares or syndicate members beasts and bosses you flame blast them but you have to apply the combustion from the fireball that is kind of the pseudo seventh link right you have to have your ores and you're good you're good to go just like in the beginning you can see the the playthrough it's, it's pretty much very comfortable and you can off screen things too which i love the fireball gmp night belief it's just insanely safe to do tier 6 things just off screen things and then when something tougher appears, you just flame blast it to, I don't know, ashes. So, uh, there's no big secrets. Always dodge and evade your slams. Now, something that is very important in the game is the defenses. So, we have many defenses. The first thing is your life pools. In my case here, I have 6,078 life. It's red, it's to the left side, and it's life. You can recover with a divine life flask. Uh, you can recover with a life flask. When you press the flask, the life recovers either instantaneously or additively. And you have life regen, and it's the basic. It, you, it, and it's the basic. You start with life. There is an alternate type of defense called energy shield. In the case here, I have a negligible amount of energy shields, 99. And the rule is that you 
invested in your ascendancy, in the passive trees, and with items, you invest in it. And it's stable, it doesn't increase by level, you gain 12 life and 6 mana every level, so the more level you have, the more life you're going to have, at least base life, base life and life from gear is scaled from the tree for life. But energy shield doesn't scale with level, it scales with your intelligence, with your gear and passives. It has advantages and disadvantages. You don't need to use a life flask because it recharges automatically. When you take damage, you have to wait 4 seconds for it to start regenerating. It regenerates very fast. You can do things like the Wicked Ward and the shield recharge is not interrupted by damage if your charge began recently. Recently in the game is 4 seconds, okay? Recently in the game is 4 seconds. So, you spend 4 seconds without getting hit. Then your energy shield, when it starts to regen and you have Wicked Ward paid, for 4 seconds it will regen independently of the damage that you take. And then you stop regenerating again as long as you keep taking damage unless you spend 4 seconds without taking damage. There are other ways to, to regen this. There is a leech, there is the tricksters, there is all kinds of situations and, and game mechanics that make you regenerate or recover energy shield in different ways. But this is the most basic one. You have the, the other ascendances that do that too, but that's one of the things that is more advanced and you shouldn't do this if you're just starting the game now. It is interesting, it is very interesting. It varies your builds, it makes you uh, see the game in a different way and you have one more uh, utility flask to use. But I don't advise if you're just starting the game. So, for defenses, the first thing is your life pool, right? Then you have your block chance. Okay, normally if you use a shield, you block. But shields, they block attack damage. You have two types of damage in this game regarding block. is attack damage and spell damage. Everything that is an attack can have different types of damage. Don't confuse the, the, the attack damage and spell damage with type of damage. The type of damage can be fire, cold, lightning, chaos and physical. Those are the types of damage. Then they can have tags, okay, like missile, projectile, attack, spell, and the block chance that you get from a shield, like my own here, is against attacks. So if a mob has an attack that inflicts 50% of its damage physical, 50% of its damage elemental, for example fire, having fire damage from the attack doesn't mean that that is a spell. If you block that attack, you take zero damage. Zero physical, zero fire damage. You just don't take the damage. But some mechanics of the game allow you to block spells. Which are anything that is not an attack in the game is going to be a spell damage. Even effects on the ground are, are spell damage. So when you block, you don't take the damage. In both situations of block, you are going to take the stun recovery animation. What is this? When you take a large amount of damage from your life, a large chunk of damage from your life, you get stunned. You receive an animation of stun. You stop what you're doing, running, casting a spell, and you get stunned. And sometimes you can get stun locked until you die. And that's horrible. But it's kind of rare too. One of the ways to combat this is being immune to stun or investing in stun recovery or block recovery. Stun recovery works for everything but block recovery only works when you block because when you block a big hit that would stun you, you block, you don't take the damage but you still get stunned. The stun animation now is called block animation. We have a third one called spell suppression chance. If you see the tooltip here for example, of Mage Bane, you can see here that Mage Bane, the gray text shows you 50% of damage from suppressed hits and ailments they inflict is prevented. 
This means if that you have 100% spell suppression chance, it means that you always get only 50% damage from spells. It is very desirable to get 100%, and many builds use this level of, of defense, but I like to vary. I have spell block, spell suppression, max elemental resistances as three layers of defense for the spell damage and for the elemental damage. So about resistances, the game assumes that you have 75% of all resistances of each one of them. You can see here that we have fire, cold, lightning and chaos. The game assumes that you have 75% resistances because that's the max, the normal max. So if you take 1000 damage, the game actually inflicted you 4000 damage, fire for example. And it assumes that every character is going to have 75%, right? You're going to have less than 75 in some situations, like when you are cursed, or when you have or when you have exposure to some elements. Normally the curses they can take you 30% and then the exposure takes you another 10%. But sometimes you have increased effects or decreased effects. In this case here, for example, these passives here, they diminish the effect of some curses. But nonetheless, this passives or not, I like to have 40% over 75, the cap here, right? So I feel really protected. So I try to get 115% in each of the resistances so that I don't have to think about curses and exposure. I don't have to think about both of those things because both of those things can happen and then you're dead. Something that wasn't even affecting you, you weren't, you weren't even noticing it affect you, all of a sudden kill you in an instant. You're like, whoa, oh, what killed me? And then you're recording yourself, you see you have both a curse, say, from ability and fire exposure, which means that you have approximately 35% fire resistance. Which, remember, if you have a hit that inflicts a thousand damage on you, that is 4000 damage. It's only inflicting a thousand because you have 75% resistances. Resistance of fire, for example, in our example. So you remove 3000 of the 4000 and you take 1000. But if you have 35% fire resistance, you don't eliminate 3000 anymore. You eliminate much less and you take a bigger hit. So those are the things that are very important for you to observe. Okay? Overcap resistances because of exposure and curses and sometimes the curse effects, okay? For example, these nodes or some other nodes. But I would concern myself basically with overcap, okay? Now, there is something called max resistances that is something, for example, like this here. We have Soul of Steel. Soul of Steel, you can see that gives you plus 1% to all maximum resistances. The value of this passive is immense. Because if you know that the game assumes that you always have 75% resistances, so all of the damage dealt in the game assumes this 25%. But if you have 1% of over the cap, so now you have 4% effective damage reduction. So in the case of my build here, we have, for example, 78% fire resistance. That's effectively 12% less fire damage taken at the end of the day because the game assumes that you are only taking 25% of all the fire damage that the game throws at you but then you have 3% over this and now the game is not inflicting 25% anymore the game is inflicting 22% on you so from 25% to 22% that's a lot of decrease that's a lot of difference so that's another layer of defense that I like to put Yes, sometimes I cannot get all of them, depends on your gear, depends on some passives that you have access. For example, when I come here to the Marauder, to the Gladiator, whatever I'm doing, I go for Soul of Steel, I go for other passives like this one here of the Fire, okay, that you have the Barbarism, plus one to maximum fire, and something like, some things like that that give you this extra more defense so that you don't need to concern so much about this it's not like you're going to die every now and then you're more secure you have to think too about kill resistance normally you don't care about this 
But if you progress through the campaign, sometimes you are going to be caring about this. So it's nice to find throughout leveling a nice amethyst flask, okay, so that you don't die for balls that you, you're concerned about, like Arakali or the Wadri. But after mapping, you have to concern yourself with some bosses and some high tier maps. Because something like, I don't know, there's some mobs that they apply blight, for example. And I remember this death of mine that was tier 13 map. I think four mobs came to me and blighted me. And I died so fast. But I had, I think, what, minus 10% kills resistance? That not only you take all the 4,000 kills damage, but you take more than that. So the game, again, assumes that you have 75%. Doesn't matter how you do it, you have to do it. Because some situations are going to just kill you. And outright some bosses are going to have a lot of kills damage. Or even mixed kills damage, physical kills damage, or elements. So you have to take care of your kills resistance. The more you push in the maps, and through all the campaigns, right? And I think the biggest layer of defense is your mouse clicks. You have to position yourself well. You have to get out of hits, you have to get out of clear slams, you have to position yourself in decent spots, you don't have to be on top of, I don't know, burning ground, for example, or shocking ground if you're vulnerable to shock. So you have to concern yourself with your positioning, you have to see your build, is your build killing fast, you have to be diminish the velocities that you go through the maps. You have the decision at the end of the day. So that's one of the things that I really like in Hardcore, that yeah, you can have a BS death, but at the end of the day, it was you, all you. Now, for the offensive stats, you have to take into consideration what I said before about tags. You have to organize your gems and your skills, your support gems, and everything that you have in the passives and your ascendancy related to your tags. You have to really organize it. And you have to remember that more is better than increased and less is worse than decreased. These things are very important. If you want to check your damage in Path of Building, you have to know how to configure this, but this is another video. Just know that this is correctly configured. And I also apply the Is the enemy a boss? Yes, Guardian Pinnacle boss. Look at the DPS here, 1 million in this. But if I put here no, the damage all of a sudden goes to 1.4 million. So I like to put here Standard Boss or Guardian Pinnacle Boss so that you see that the damage here is feasible, it's real, 1 million DPS on, on dot, 1 million dot DPS is pretty decent for, for Pinnacle Bosses. It's, it's fine, you can actually do all your content. And you can look my videos here, you can go over, and you can find many of my kills in many of the Pinnacle Bosses, many tier 16 maps, explanations, many types, yeah. I'm here streaming every time. And you can see that uh, it's it's very doable. So don't concern yourself too much in calculating the DPS on, on POB. You just have to make sure that everything is right and then your damage is going to be fine. You have to have sometimes one skill that works for all. Sometimes you have to have one skill that works only for single targets and one for clear speed. That's the case of this build here. This build has the fireball setup that works for clear speed, that is fireball with greater multiple projectile support, so you cast more fireballs instead of one five. Then the ignite proliferation makes look ignites caused by supported skills spread to other enemies within a radius of 20. So you have your ignite spreading, and since the build is based on ignite, you are going to be clearing screens easily. So you don't miss out on, on experience, you don't miss out on possible drops because you're clearing the screens. And when you see a rare, you just use your flame glass. And then you you annihilate the rare very fast. Or bosses, even leveling. So that's my this the helmet and the body armor of my build are clear speed and single targets. Not only, but you can see here in combustion support. Enemies ignited by supported skills have minus 10% to fire resistance. This is not in this 6 link setup. So it makes this a pseudo 7th link of my flame blast. Because I always apply fireball and then I channel the flame blast. 
apply fireball, channel and flame blast. This way I'm not applying fireball, I'm applying combustion because of my fireball. So you have a little more efficient on your damage over time. And you have to think about these things. And apart from that, you need now to understand gems and skills. And I'm going to break it all down for you. The skills and the items and the stats of the items. Everything that you need to know. So this is the breakdown of the skills. I'm going to start, I'm going to start by the ascendancy. And we are going to go from there. So the small... Passives, they give you small things, but it's influential at the end of the day. In some here you have 10, 20, 30, 40% increase elemental damage from the four passives. And you have a little bit of cast speed here. You have fire damage over multiplier here. And you have 12% uh, to all elemental resistances. So they are very influential. Even the small passives on your Senna 3 they are very influential. Well, let's go for the golems. You have here plus one maximum number of summon golems, plus one, and you have here, plus one. This is outside of the ascendancy, but it's important to talk in one go. So, you have one maximum golem with plus one, plus one, plus one, now you have four maximum golems. And I have four golems, four different types of golems. So what happens is this, you have a buff like the kills golem buff here, that is one of the best buffs in the game, in my opinion, for defense. So you have 4% additional physical damage reduction. That is flat. There is not a calculation where formula like armor is just flat. Just gives you this much physical damage reduction. 4%. Now, you have here 100% increased effect of buffs granted by your golem. Then you have here 25% increased effect of buffs granted by your golems per summoned golem. We have 4 golems. 100% with 100%. 200% increased. Now you have here the whole node. 20% increased effective buffs granted by your golems. 20, 40, you have 80 here. So you have a total of 100, 280% increased. So if you get the effect of your golem being 100%, when you have 280% on top of 100%, you just multiply the effect of the golem by 3.8. So it gets your calculator and you multiply. You have 4% times 3.8. So you have a total of 15.2 additional physical damage reduction. That is a lot of physical damage reduction. So by having among the four golems that are summoned at least one chaos golem, you have this buff. And by having this buff and 280% increased effect of the buff, you have 15.2 additional physical damage reduction. And you do this with every single buff. You have here flame golem, 20% increased damage. So you multiply 20 times 3.8, you get 76% increased damage. So it, it, it doesn't matter what is your build, it's going to have 76% increased damage on top of it. Now, the life regen here, we have 110, then you are going to have 110 times 3.8. One golem summoned gives you 418 life regenerated per second. And then you have the lightning golem here, 10% increase attack and cast speed. Cast speed is what matters for us. So you have 10 times 3.8. You have 38% cast speed from one golem. For comparison, I have this full node here. You have 4, 8, 18% with 3 passive skills. And 6% increase cast speed for each different known instant spell you've cast recently. So if you have 18% plus 6 or 12, you don't even touch the 38% that one golem gives you. You d it doesn't matter if you have four lightning golems or four chaos golems. You don't have the buff multiple times or you don't have a bonus on the buff by having multiple types of the same buff golem. So what you do is that you have one type of each buff. So I have chaos golem, fire, flame golem, lightning golem and stone, stone golem. Very powerful buffs. And they tank some hits for you too. 
one of the things here is that the summon golems are immune to elemental damage so they can tank freely they can be little barriers for like projectiles that have i don't know elemental damage in them so that you, they, they are going to ignore the elemental damage and take the physical damage and even if they die you don't have to book keep this in your mind because the summon golems are resummoned four seconds after being killed very good very handy now continuing here with the passive skills of the ascendancy we have Shaper of Flames. This is essential for this build because my build ignites and inflicts ignite damage, ignition damage, which is damage over time. So hits always ignite. All damage can ignite. So all of my hits ignite. And normally fire damage has a chance on ignite, on crits, right? But you can have chance to ignite given by other skills, like for example. Here, Holy Dominion have 10% chance to freeze, shock, and ignite. Crits always apply the ailments correspondent to them. For example, if you crit with a fire skill, the enemy will be ignited. But if you don't crit and just hit, you have to have chances to ignite, like the Holy Dominion. Have one in every 10 hits that is not a critical hit of fire damage with Holy Dominion paid, means that the enemy is going to get ignited but if you have shaper of flames you all your damage can ignite my not only my hits always ignite but all my damage can ignite which means that lightning damage ignites cold damage ignites physical damage ignites it's going to be fire damage it's going to be fire damage over time but it's going to be based on the initial hit which ignited so if you inf inflicted a large physical hit that is going to be just like a large fire hit for the ignition purposes of calculation. And then we have here the 25% more damage with ignites you inflict with hits for which the highest damage type is fire. So we inflict fire damage, we have on top of this 25% more. Insanely powerful. And on top of this I have some mana regen and exposure here. My gloves inflict exposure, naturally. If you don't have gloves like this, you have to search for them, you have to look for them, you have to apply the, the currency on them. Or you have to have Wave of Conviction to apply fire exposure on the enemies with the highest damage type being fire. And then the exposure you inflict applies an extra minus 25% to the effective resistance. So you can see here that my implicit on these gloves applies minus 11%. On top of that, we have 25%, so my any of my hits will apply minus 36% fire resistance on the enemy, whichever enemy. Very powerful ascendancy. Now, apart from my ascendancy, you have the travel nodes. The travel nodes, they are going to give you attributes, they are going to give you minimum attributes for equipping items, and you are going to have sometimes elemental damage, sometimes dexterity, Things that are varied. So I'm going to explain here the notables. We have here the first one, Arcanist Dominion, which gives you cast speed, spell damage that doesn't really influence us, and intelligence. This is mostly a travel node. Travel node for these two here. Minion damage and minion damage. Here you have 15% increase in minion damage, and here you have 20% increase in minion damage. This helps us because of spiritual aid. Increase and reductions to minion damage also affect you. So this is very important. And don't confuse this with more minion damage. More minion damage appears in the gems, the support gems of minion damage. So don't care about the support gems of minion damage. Just care about the passive nodes that you can get from the tree. Which in my case here are minion damage, Lord of the Dead, the travel here, minion damage and life, travel here, and redemption, and righteous arm. After that, you have all of my life nodes, I have all of the knife nodes that I can, and in this case here it's a travel node, here you have the travel nodes to get the important ones, and here I don't need to get all of this, because 6078 life is more than enough, you're tanking enough. And then you need to get your other points and invest in damage, or else you are going to be unbalanced. And then, on top of that, have all the masteries, because you can get this one exactly here. You can read. 
10% more maximum life if you have at least six life masters allocated. And one of these life masters here is 15% increase in maximum life if there, if there are no life modifiers on equipped body armor, which I don't. And it's now very common for you to look for other modifiers on body armor because of this one here, if you are in a life-based build. Apart from that, all elemental resistances. This is a travel node. It's sweet for the evasion and armor, but it's mostly a travel node and it's mostly for the elemental resistances. Here you have a little more life and life recovery from flasks that I feel like I, I can get. And you can see that if I get three nodes here, I get 15% maximum life. But three nodes here gives you four, four, eight, with seven, fifteen percent. But you gain some pluses. You gain increased life recovery from flasks, you gain uh, increased life recovery from flasks, and gain one charge every three seconds. So instead of paying three points here, that will give me fifteen percent maximum life, if nothing else, I get the same fifteen percent here with some more bonuses. Since I use life flask, why not have the three points here instead of there? To be we have here the travel nodes. These two travel nodes are very powerful because they give you spell suppress chance. This node here is spell suppress and evasion. And that together with this notable, sorry, this is a keystone, Mage Bane, dexterity provides no inherent bonus to evasion rating. Plus 1% chance to suppress spell damage per 15 dexterity. It's very really powerful because this together with this and maybe some gear. We got a lot of spell suppression, which is very, very good. Here, mana sustain nodes, okay, maximum mana, mana regen and reduce the mana cost of skills. And here, maximum mana, mana regen, reduce the mana cost of skills. Very powerful. Now, the master is increasing mana reservation efficiency of skills. This, reservation efficiency, together with these two here and the one here makes us be able to have this here going on for us. Here I'm missing the Arctic Armor because I put it away. So that we can cast our spells and still have the mana sustain going on for us, right? You have more life here and some Chaos Resistance. This really helps to get the cap, okay? I'm over capped. It's one it was not necessary, but we have gear for that. I anointed here Holy Fire, which gives us fire resistance and fire damage over time multiplier for here, without having to travel to here, with the Blight Oils. Here I have Cast Speed and the Cast Speed for different non-resistance spells. Very powerful overall. It's very important to have Cast Speeds to be very comfortable when you're casting your clear spells, which in my case are Fireball or when you are channeling because you need to get that window that the boss gives you and actually damage it. Instead, you, you, you don't want this. That's not good. This is good. This is good. And it needs to be fast, right? Apart from that, I have one jewel node here. One jewel node here. I have one more jewel node here. I have one jewel also from the belt. And here you have fire damage and fire damage. I have fire damage flat here, and damage penetration doesn't matter for us. It just matters the fire damage. And here, very important, fire damage over time multiplier. That's very powerful. And here, fire damage, fire damage over time multiplier, super powerful. And of course, fire exposure in fix applies an extra minus 5% to fire resistance. So we have 5 with 25, 30. With 11 minus 41% fire resistance on the enemy spaces. So that's for the passives for you guys. So here I'm going to break down every one of my gems so that you understand everything that's happening in this build. Let's start with the fireball setup. So this is the fireball. It's a large, it's a large hitting spell that casts a fireball onto a target. It explodes and inflicts an ignite. And it also inflicts ignites always because I have this skill here, um, Shaper of Flames. So all my damage always ignites. Because it always ignites, it always applies combustion from combustion support. This helps both the single targets and the clear speed. And the GMP, or Greater Multiple Projective Support, is so that it hits all the screen 
or even the off screen. So you have five projectiles cast instead of one. And the Ignite Proliferation is the real, together with the GMP, clear speed of the thing. Because since everything ignites, you can read here, ignites caused by supported skills spread to other enemies within a radius of 20. So everything that is hit will die, because it will ignite to death. And what was not hit will die, because it was close to what was hit. And when there is a wear, there is there left over, you just destroy it with the flame blast that I'm going to say now. Flame Blast, you channel up to 10 maximum stages, as you can see here. So, after you channel for 10 stages, and I have cast speed to channel fast, you release and then just boom, a little explosion. This explosion inflicts a lot of damage, and the ignite damage is based on the initial damage. So, the build is based on ignite, so things are going to die over time. Deadly ailment support. This makes you deal 80% less damage with hits, but 44% more damage with ailments. So, Ignite is an ailment, therefore, you're going to inflict a lot more damage. Remember, more is better than increase it. Swift Affliction, 39% more damage over time, and 25% less duration. So, the damage is inflicted faster, and this has some synergy with the Cloak of Flame, that have incre increased Ignite's duration, 73% increased Ignite's duration. So they synergize well, but it's better that you burn fast because you can apply it another, another, another. Because normally when it burns faster, it means the same damage is in a smaller time span. Now here we have cruelty support. 24% more damage with hits. And you apply cruelty. Cruelty grants damage over time inflicted by you, Ruti grants more damage over time with supported skills based on the percent of maximum life removed by a damaging hit. Alright? Lasts for 4 seconds, by default it has a maximum effect of 40% which is unaffected by modifier to its effects. You have the calculations here, but cruelty is ideal, because not only helps on the hit damage, but also gives you that nice buff that influences the damage over time. Now you have here infused channeling. This is both defensive and offensive. It's offensive because you have 24% more damage out of the blue, oof, direct, and then you have 10% more damage of types matching supported skill gem stags. So this 10% here, when I'm infusing, I gain of flame blast, which is spell, AoE, fire, and channeling. So I gain 10% on those four tags, that is the tag of the gem that is being cast right now. And you gain infusing after you channel 4.6 seconds. When you channel 4.6 seconds, you gain infused. Infused gives you 10% more from the tags, but also you take 8% less damage from hits of types matching the skill gem stags. So after channeling for 0.6 seconds, you gain infused. Infused makes you inflict more damage and take less damage of spell, AoE, fire, and channeling. This is very good. This is a well-rounded gem. Infused channeling, it's a must. And by less, burning damage support. You have 34% more burning damage. As I hover over the gems, you see it, some more numbers, and these numbers normally are because of the quality of the gem. The quality matters, but it's an end-game thing. You can see that some of my gems are corrupted, like for example the Flame Blast. It's 21 levels from gem. There is a currency called Veil Ward that corrupts an item, modifying it unpredictably. You can craft your items, you can modify your items, but after you Veil Orb them, you corrupt them. And corrupted items cannot be further modified. With very small exceptions there. One of the outcomes, possible outcomes of corruption, which is 25% chance, is that the gem gains one level. You can corrupt gems, uh, body, armor, helmets, you can corrupt most things on the game that you can equip. So when it's on gems, it's very useful to corrupt spell gems level 20 with 20 quality, which mine has so that you have 25% chance of obtaining a level 21 gem 
which increases the base damage of the gym and greatly increases your DPS. So it's a must to corrupt gems. You can see that normally people have off hands. You see, that's my set of weapon and shield. But people normally equip off hands to have gems leveling in their off hands. This is very common. So that you can get to level 88 and corrupt six gems. And then you get to level, I don't know, 91, then 92, then 94, so on and so forth. That you take time leveling a gem from 1 to 20 or from 11 to 20. Because normally when you're in the maps, you buy these gems at level 11 from the vendors. Now for my scepter here, I have Tempest Shield. Tempest Shield is a buff that reserves 25% of my mana. But... It reserves a little less because I have a skill that makes me reserve less mana, okay? So you can see that my mana is all reserved here, it's all grayed out. And after it reserves 25% of my mana, I, my shield shines. You can see here that's, the, that's my microtransaction of Tempest Shield. When I'm ready, I'm and before. you can see that it gives you 25% chance to block spell damage while holding a shield. And, of course, with the Tempest Shield activated. And you get to be immune to shock. This is great. This is huge. This is a large buff passive. Right? And also there is a plus that when you block with the Tempest Shield, a lightning bolt comes out of it and chains over enemies, inflicting lightning damage. But that's, that's just a plus. You don't, you don't have to take this into consideration because it's, it's unlinked. I don't have... I don't scale damage, lightning damage. It scales with my elemental damage and my spell damage, but don't take this into consideration. It's just a defensive buff. I have some lightning golem and clarity here too. The lightning golem is one of my four golems for this build. This build has a lot going on with the golems. So this golem here makes you have 10% increased attack and cast speed. It's a great buff. Especially for channeling builds because you want to channel very fast in the small windows that you have to hit enemies like bosses or pinnacle bosses, okay? Clarity, insanely powerful for mana sustain. Since they made a rework of mana some leagues ago that everyone must spend gems and passes with mana. There's no joke. Your mana goes away. You have to invest in it. So clarity is a must. In this case, you can also see that it's corrupted. It's level 21, so it's pretty good. It's corrupted to be level 21, so that I reserve a little more, but I regenerate a little more too. So socketed on my shield, I have flame dash. That is a travel skill. You can see the tags there. Spell, movement, duration, fire, travel, blink. Three tags for it. It is movement, travel, and blink skill, okay? It's, it helps you to move. You move from one place to another. If you cast them back to back, if you hold the button, it's not going to have an animation when you cast first, but between the first and second cast, you have an animation. You can see. Even though I have a lot of cast speed, but you can see the animation there. And this animation can kill you. So, in my... When you flame dash, you have to wait a bit so that you, the animation that you're not casting will end without you animating and then if you wait this time, you can cast several times without animation. In my case, it's very brief because I have a lot of cast speed, okay? Then, we have here Steel Skin. Steel Skin is one of the guard skills. You can see that is very powerful, it blocks damage. 72% of damage from hits is taken from the buff before life or energy shield. This does not work for damage over time, it works for hits. And damage over time doesn't hit, remember that. But, you can see that you gain here 2403 of a shield. So your life effectively is 8500 for some time. Because 70% goes from the shield, 30% from your life, until your shield is gone, then the rest is for your life. I put it in the movement button, as you can see, so that I use all the time that it's free and in cooldown. And since both these skills are spells, because they have the tag spell that you can see there, 
I put Arcane Surge level 1 here because Arcane Surge has a nice synergy with skills that you use all the time and you spend mana so that you have a little more of mana sustain. So you can see here that a buff will appear now. That's the Arcane Surge. And if I use our Flame Dash and Steel Skin, it keeps refreshing, you see? So all the time it gets refreshed, so I have this sweet, sweet 30% increase in mana regeneration from Arcane Surge here. Now for my gloves, I have Malevolence, that is a must of an aura to have. It reserves your mana, as you already know, and you inflict 20% more damage over time. It's huge. And on top of that, you have increased skill effect duration, also huge for damage over time builds. And socketed here, we have Summon Stone Golem, one of my four golems that are buffs. This golem grants 110 life regenerator per second. This is very powerful. That, together with the mod of some of my items, like here, regenerate 112, and I have here a total of 897.4 life regenerated per second. This, of course, I have passive skills here, I have many things giving me this. So when I take damage, my life tops up very fast. On top of that, I have life too, divine life flasks here too. So powerful golem to have, and one of one more of the golems to have the synergy of having multiple golems and the buffs of the golems working with each other. Huge charge and faster attacks. Faster attacks support huge charge so that I can move around fast. That's basically it. It's there for this, for me to move. That's it. If I remove the faster attacks, it's not as sweet. It is still decent. It takes you from one place to another, but with the shield charge, you can really rely better on it for even dodge. And if you don't have the flame dash with you at the time, because it has charges, you can see here that the flame dash has charges. You can shoot charge well for dodge and also for traveling around, it's pretty good. And it spends so little mana that my mana just comes back very fast. Now here, on the boots, I have summon Flame Golem. Flame Golem gives you 20% increase in damage. And again, it's one more of the golems. The golems take some damage for you. The golems influence each other, giving you buff uh, uh, effect. And it's just great. And here you have Chaos Golem. The Chaos Golem grants 4% additional physical damage reduction. When it's written like this, it means that it influences physical damage over time, which is Corrupted Blood and Blade altogether. Together with, of course, hits. So this calculation is superior to the calculation of armor, because this is flat. The armor will depend on the size of the hits, will depend on the amount of armor that you have, so when you have a value like this, it's just flat. And we have here curling support. Curling support is supporting both golems and the Arctic armor, but it doesn't change the Arctic armor. So you have to think about the golems. I don't inflict damage with my golems, but they attack. They do. Curling support is a gem that says Kill enemies that have 10% life or lower when hit by supported skills. So anything that has 10% or less life when hit by the golems, my golems don't have investment of damage, they don't even have accuracy, they cast spells. So anything that comes out of these two golems, the Chaos Golem and Flame Golem, that hits enemies, especially bosses, I'm talking about bosses here, that have 10% or less life, they are cold. So I like to leave it there on these builds because it really helps a lot. Arctic Armor is similar to Tempest Shield here. It reserves 25% of your mana. It lets you be immune to freeze, which is also huge. And also when you are stationary, you take 21% less physical damage and 21% less fire damage. Those all together makes it a great buff, great defensive buff. But on top of that, they created the Veil Arctic Armor some weeks ago. So now I'm going to go over the end game items that I produced for these builds to boost the DPS and boost the defenses and what you need to look for in items. What you need to look for is resistances, life, 
for defenses, sometimes block, sometimes spell suppression, depending on what you want. And these things can come in different values, different shapes. You have to learn how to see this. You come here for this website called Craft of Exile. And here you mix, you, you use this website a little bit. You go here, for example, Boots, Boots Intelligence, and you're going to see every single affix and suffix that you can have in any of the items. You just see it. I remember that the item has a total of six affixes, to which three are prefixes and three are suffixes. So you can only have three of each, with very rare exceptions. And then you have implicits that are not affixes, so they are not prefixes and suffixes. And there are things like the maximum mana for this ring, or the maximum mana for this other ring, or the strength and dexterity of this amulet. These are implicit, okay? So, when you look for items, you have to look for defenses in the armor, normally. And you, if you are stacking armor, for example, in a Juggernaut, you have to look for armor, obviously. And you are going to scale this armor with items, uniques, and your passive skill tree. And you also have to look for your damage. Remember the gem tag? We have here spell, AoE, fire, and channeling for flame blast. These are very important that you look for these types of damage in your items. For example, this scepter here that I crafted has damage over time multiplier, fire damage over time multiplier, fire damage to spells, plus one to level of all spell skill gems, and plus one to level of all fire spell skill gems, and burning damage. So this is a crazy good scepter, and it has all of all the implicit elemental damage. So when you are looking for items, you have to look for defenses, and you have to look for offenses. And normally the offenses, just look at the tags of your gems, and you can't miss it. And the rest you find in the wiki, so it's not that hard. You can see each item here have different things. And let's go one by one. The shield here, you take 6% reduced extra damage from critical strikes. This is rare to obtain. You can be mean to create with the assassin here. You can... Uh, this is the trickster. This is the assassin is here. You can have one of those here. The mastery. You take 30% reduced extra damage from critical strikes. The second mastery. Okay. And you can, you can find more of those. But it's very important to take care. Go to critical strike. Because the monster creates and you can die. For crates obviously. So... Apart from that, this shield gives you a lot of armor. Armor is always good, but it doesn't matter, always good. Uh, maximum life, I have here plus two to all maximum resistance is insanely powerful. You have plus max in items. Additional physical damage reduction, just like the butt from my golem, is very powerful too. The helmet here, I have the maximum life, life for gen, resistances as you can see. You have the implicits of these helmets are obtained with this currency here. This currency here, Lesser Eldritch Icor and Lesser Eldritch Ember. You can have Lesser, you can have Greater, you can have different types, but it's basically Eldritch Icor and Eldritch Ember. They apply these implicits. They, when you use them on an item, they automatically become the, the implicit, which is this here, for example. You can see that the icons by the side of the, the Plague Touch and Serpent Skate go to the text. You have one icon on one side, one icon on the other. Syria Zark for the red icon, Eater of the Worlds for the other icon, bluish. Very important these in places. In here you can see that I gained flammability curse effect, physical damage from hits taking us fire damage. You have here in the gloves you have explosion hit, fire damage over, multi over time multiplier. In here I have increased effect of buffs granted by your golems and ignites you inflict you damage 10% faster. And that's it. that's what you can get with this. In the case of my uniques here, I have Cinder Solar Urn that makes the enemy ignited by you during effects take 10% increased damage. That's huge. Because a debuff on the enemy is a more multiplier. Ashes of the Stars, it's pretty rare. You have to farm a boss and it's like pretty slim the chance to get it. You get plus 1 to level all skill gems, plus 25% to quality of all skill gems, 15% increase in reservation efficiency of skills, and increase experience skills. This is an insanely powerful item. It sells for a lot, and it's, it's very, very good. That's insanely powerful. 
Cloak of Flame is, is insanely defensive, and it has mild uses for, for offensive, so just more like quality of life. It's insanely defensive. I love these items, very powerful. You can get better options, but I'd like to make a real rounded build that can be very tanky against like things in, in hardcore as well, so they don't die easily. Apart from that, we have, for example, the base Opal Ring that you need level 80 to use. You can see the implicit elemental damage, and you can use just the orb to get the elemental damage to be 30%. Heavy flasks, they are necessary. For example, the quick silver gives you uh, speed, the jade flask gives you evasion rating, and quartz flask gives you spell suppress. And these are four desirable mods to have in any jewel. In my case, because of the mage bane, I like dexterity. Fire damage to spells, always desirable. Maximum life, added spell, fire damage, wall holding a shield. Everything here is very, very desirable. So you should look for those. So overall, I love this build. This build just helps you so much. It's very simple to follow. It's very simple to acquire this if you know what you're doing. It's not very hard to, to really get to the top of this build. Very comfortable, you can kill things off screen, you can kill things single targets. I love the, the aspect of killing things off screen and then killing everything uh, by the ignite proliferation. And also the, the flame blast kills things in a very very orderly manner so yeah i hope that you have enjoyed this guide help me out with this subscribe button i need to get 1000 youtube subscribers so that i can get the little pennies starting to count from youtube i hope that you have enjoyed all the explanation that i gave for initial like the, the the newcomers people are coming from the for bad people that are like just trying to test out for exile or if you're you were playing for exile for a long time now i don't know one two years or some months and i explained something that you didn't know I, i'm very glad that i can do this for you guys and i hope that you have a great day today i see you later today in trial of the, the ancients bye